Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming to the program at the Art Institute of Chicago. My name is Yeon Su Ji. I am Korean art creator at the Art Institute of uh, Chicago, and I am going to uh, introduce our uh, speaker, wonderful speaker today. Uh, so today's program is the art and culture of the Tang Dynasty, the Silk Road, and then China's golden age of cosmopolitan. We just opened the gallery uh, of the Tang Silk Road Gallery. You probably have already seen it, or if you haven't seen it, please uh, just stop by and then look at the gallery. Uh, so to uh, uh, introduce our speaker, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, today's program with the Sunyi O. Sun Yi is assistant creator of Chinese art in the Arts of Asia department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, prior to joining to the Art Institute in 2023, in July, she worked with the East Asian art collections at the Harvard Art Museums, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, Villa Itati in Florence, Italy, and Seoul National University Museum. She has also contributed as an author, editor, and translator to publications from the UK, Japan, and Korea. She has already a very illustrative career as a young scholar. Uh, Sunyi holds a PhD from Harvard University, where she, she specialized in Chinese paintings and the later Buddhist arts. So without further ado, please welcome Sunyi with a warm round of applause. Okay, thank you, Yansu, for your kind introduction. And I also, uh, I would also like to extend my gratitude to Francis, Mel, and Katie, and everyone from the AB team um, who made today's lecture possible, and also everyone um, in the audience who came here on the first day of the long weekend. So as we can see from the title of this talk, I will talk about this Silk Road a lot in the next 40 minutes. But what is the Silk Road? So when I just started uh, preparing this lecture, I googled the Silk Road out of curiosity. Under the places category uh, on the result page, I got locations for a few Chinese restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> for the videos, I happened to click some without knowing what they were about. Um, and they were mostly about the first marketplace on the dark web. <laughs> I hope um, you didn't expect to hear about the dark web um, and Bitcoin today. <laughs> um, even if you did, please stay because this Silk Road is also very interesting. So the Silk Road I will talk about um, was not an actual road. It refers to a loose network of a marked path connecting China to the Mediterranean. The path covered almost 5,000 miles across some of the world's harshest landscapes with high mountain ranges and shifting sands of the Taklamakan Desert. Through this route, Chinese silk, tea, paper, and ceramics made their way westward from China, while goods like horses, glassware, metalware, grapes traveled east from Middle East and Central Asia. This trade along the Silk Road was active from the second century before Common Era until the mid 15th century, and silk was certainly one of the most important commodities. Before we move on to China, let's look at this mural from the 7th century Sogdian rule of Samarkand in present-day Uzbekistan. Part of this mural shows envoys from Tang Dynasty China presenting their gifts to the king of Samarkand. The figure at the right end of the group is carrying silk cocoons, and the one in front of him holds undyed silk thread. The gift of China's finest raw materials for silk implies that the recipient already had knowledge of silk production, which had spread outside of China at the time um, this mural was created. On the other hand, Chinese textiles show Central Asian adaptations of Greco-Roman uh, motifs that gave Chinese weavers inspiration, as we can see in this piece of silk. 
The floral medallion with symmetrically curled and layered tendrils was derived from the classical palmette motif and was refined by Chinese weavers. Soon this design permeated East Asian decorative arts. So the transmission of designs was not confined to textiles. Floral medallions and scrolls, often with birds and grapes, decorate ceramics, silverware, and stone carvings that 8th century Chinese aristocrats commissioned for their tombs or private treasuries. Despite the importance of silk in the Eurasian trade route, the term Silk Road is rather a recent invention. It was not until 1877 that the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen coined the term Silk Road. And, the, and this name gradually gained acceptance after Swedish geographer um, Sven Hedin published his book titled The Silk Road in 1936. In the long history of the Silk Road, we will focus on the 8th century during China's Tang Dynasty, when the Silk Road trade was at its peak. Tang Dynasty's openness to the world and beyond its borders, uh, beyond its borders invited foreign cultures into central China. As a result, the Tang Dynasty capital Chang'an, present-day Xi'an, became the cosmopolitan urban center of East Asia and one of the most important stops on the cross-continental trade routes. Chang'an had a population um, of about one million with a considerable number of immigrants and visitors from Korea, Southeast Asia, and major oasis cities along the Silk Road, especially Sogdians, from the current-day Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. This led to cross-cultural exchanges in visual arts, music, dance, and religions, including Buddhism, Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism, and even Christianity. The transmission of things and knowledge did not stop in Tang, China. It continued eastward, across the Korean Peninsula, all the way to Nara, Japan, where Eastern Mediterranean and Central Asian-inspired Chinese treasures have been preserved since the 8th century. So we recently reinstalled galleries 130 and 131A to feature objects from the Tang Dynasty. This part of the Chinese art gallery connects Chinese Buddhist sculpture and early Chinese art galleries with South Asian and Southeast, Southeast Asian art galleries and further down to the ancient Mediterranean. So I'm really excited to have the new installation that can stand for a pathway to different times and places. There are countless objects in various mediums related to the Silk Road trade, but we cannot cover everything in the remaining 30 minutes. So today we will pay special attention to polychromatic earthenware called sanchai, meaning um, three-colored glaze. These sun tie wares were widely created during the Tang Dynasty, and you can see the finest examples um, from the Art Institute's collection in the newly installed galleries. But why is it called three color? The answer is very evident from this jar on the screen. It is because the decoration uses glazes predominantly in three colors of amber, green, and creamy white. The body of Santai ceramics was made of white clay coated with colored or transparent glaze. So the white may come from the natural color of the fired clay coated with a transparent glaze or a white slip. Then what about amber and green? The polychrome effect was obtained by adding coloring agents to the lead-based glaze. So Green came from copper, and amber or brownish yellow came from iron. 
Sometimes we find blue as well. So the blue came from cobalt imported from Central Asia, so it was more expensive and used sparingly, often on smaller pieces. Let's look at this dragon-handled amphora uh, for another example. We see three dominant colors, white, green, and amber here. And the green and amber colors look like as, as if they are running down along the surface. This happens because the unique characteristic of lead-based glaze. Lead-based glaze is easily fusible, but very runny. So the heat in the kin makes um, the glaze move around while gravity pulls it down. For this reason, the potters applied colored glazes strategically around the rim and the shoulder um, so that um, they drip toward the lower portion of, uh, of the vessel during firing, yet without running all the way down to the bottom. Because if, if the glaze reaches the bottom and then uh, the floor of the kin, it will it might damage the vessel and the kin um, at the same time. So it was not really a desirable situation. But what is this vessel's business with the Silk Road? The design of this vessel is, in fact, not entirely indigenous to China. Its ovoid body and tall neck resemble the shape of Greco-Roman amphoras made in the Eastern Mediterranean, while its animal-headed handles allude to versions in Persian and Central Asian metalwork. If we place them on the map, we can see that the design traveled eastward from Greece and the Middle East to China. But this amphora is not the only example of such transmission. Let's see this right tone also on display at Gallery 131. A right tone is a conical drinking vessel used in ancient Greece and Middle East, typically made in the form of an animal's head or its upper body, with a hole at the bottom to drink from. So you can imagine drinking the liquid from the bottom of this cone like this. Tang Dynasty potters borrowed the design but transformed the right tone to create distinctively local vessels. Unlike the Western counterparts, Chinese ones have closed bottoms so that people could use them like conventional cups. So the one on the right uh, and on the slide is the Chinese example. So we can, um, it has the closed bottom so that they can just pour the liquid from the top and then drink from the top. But it still has Central Asian um, decorative motif like grapes and um, some vegetal forms. And um, the, the head of the animal is replaced with the dragon, which is more familiar to Chinese customers. Likewise, the design of this phoenix-headed ewer um, likely came from Central Asia. As we can see from this Sogdian metal ewer, now in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. The Chinese potter adopted the overall form of the ewer decorated with floral motif, but replaced the winged camel. So, uh, so th this winged camel, which is which must have been very unfamiliar to um, Chinese viewers with the phoenix um, that must have been more familiar to their customers. However, these vessels and sculptures were not made for practical use. Santai pottery was fired at a relatively low temperature around 1000 degrees Celsius or about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit which makes them too soft, thus unsuitable for everyday use. So we can actually see a lot of cracks um, in surviving Santai wares because they're, they're very fragile and, and rather soft. So it's, it's very easy to break apart. Moreover, the problem was the glaze. Their lead-based glaze uh, was poisonous. So it was uh, never practical. But the dazzling colors and glossy surface they make were ideal for display, especially for funerals. 
Because of the Tang Dynasty's strict sumptuary law, the size of tombs, the number of funerary models, and the materials used for funerary objects were regulated based on the status of the deceased. Interestingly, the stricter restrictions on the materials used for burial objects led to the popularity of um, clay models. In the early 8th century, the court decreed that gold and silver could not be used for burial objects. Since then, for about 50 years, people have replaced expensive silverware and gilded bronze sculptures with brightly glazed pottery for funerary rituals. The potters not only made small vessels, but also replicated anything valued by the deceased. And one of the most prized possessions to replicate is actually in these pictures of the excavation site on the screen. Although it's covered in dirt, we are going to see the cleaner version on the next slide. So it's the horse. So horses had a great significance in the lives of Chinese aristocrats and something they aspire to have, have even in the, the afterlife. Since the Han Dynasty in the second century before Common Era, Chinese empires have been interested in good horses from Central Asia. So the emperors regularly sent emissaries to buy them from Central Asian nomadic groups or acquire them through military campaigns. The one on the right uh, is a famous bronze model called Flying Horse. It is from the second century Common Era, so it's like six, 600 years before, five, 600 years before um, the Tang Dynasty. But it was discovered in um, Han Dynasty General's tomb. So we can see even, even um, a lot earlier times, horses were so valued. And when the general passed away, they wanted to be buried with the horse. The most sought after horses were the so-called heavenly horses or blood sweating horses from the kingdom of Faragana in present day Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So I was, when I saw this photo of this famous horse, I was wondering why they were called blood sweating horse while heavenly horse, I mean, it sounds about right because they're so white and bright and very elegant. Um, and this is a side note. So their, their hair is nearly transparent. Um, so whenever they run really fast, and then when their blood like circulates so fast, people can see uh, their body turning into red because their hair is nearly transparent and so glossy. Um, so that's why they, they got to have the nickname of blood sweating horse, even from ancient China. So acquisition of these, these valuable and unique horses enabled the Han Dynasty to defeat the nomadic Xiongnu confedera confederation and extend their power deep into Central Asia. And Central Asian horses continue to be loved by the Tang Dynasty people, as we can assume from the Santai horse model on the left-hand side of this slide. And this horse is on view in the gallery. You can take a look. Um, later if you haven't done so. During the Tang Dynasty, horse breeding became more domesticated as many breeders and grooms moved to China from Central Asia. So um, Gansu province in Northwestern China was their main breeding area. An estimated 430,000 horses were bred there. So naturally, potters created models of these grooms and breeders too. Horses were not only an integral part of military exercises, but were also used in leisure activities such as outings, hunting, and sports, which explains their higher demand and popularity during the Tang Dynasty, whose capital was one of the biggest and the most populated cities in the world at that time. So this is a, a part of mural from the Tang Dynasty tomb, and this is a scene of polo, uh, playing, uh, people playing polo game. 
In particular, um, a large flying horse, such as the famous blood sweating horse, signified the reward of um, military campaigns in the West, the foundation of imperial stability and economic prosperity. And its clay replicas were treasured as burials for prominent figures in the Tang Dynasty. The sculptor of this horse on the left-hand side of the slide masterfully captured the power and elegance of the horse. They also made extra effort in rendering the leather saddle and harness the um, ornaments. You will be able to see those ornaments and the texture of the saddle a lot more better um, when you see it in person in the gallery. This model is nearly 30 inches high um, and requires two or more molds to assemble. So we can imagine the amount of material and labor that was invested in creating this horse. Santai horse models were often found with grooms, as I mentioned um, earlier. So uh, when we see these models of grooms, their arms are posed as if they were like harnessing the horse. And when we look at these groom figures, we can see that the potters try to capture the physiological features with pronounced eyes and noses. Their clothing consisting of a coat with a white la um, lapels and trousers tucked into knee-high boots originated in Western Asia. The same characteristics are found in tomb paintings suggesting uh, the familiar presence of Central or West Asian people in the Tang Dynasty. Along with these horses and their grooms, camels were also sculpted and buried in tombs as auspicious images. Bactrian camels arrived in the Tang Dynasty capital Chang'an, led by grooms and merchants who traveled from the Taklamakin Desert in China's northwestern borderland. If we look um, class closely at the rider, we find again um, the Central Asian clothing with a white lapel um, collar and a cone-shaped head. And um, the, the rider has thick eyebrows and large eyes and pronounced nose, um, which also follows the facial features that Tang artists reserved for their Western neighbors. There's an extraordinary example of a Santai camel with five musicians on it. Central Asian rulers sometimes sent entertainers as tribute to the Tang court, and many independent performers traveled to China as well. The most prized dancers were from Tashkent and Samarkand, and they usually traveled with merchants, offering their services to local people along the Silk Roads leading to China. Because packs of these camels carried valuable goods and rare performers from the West, they were considered novelties and stood as a symbol of wealth. To wish for the deceased's continued fortune in the afterlife, camels and horses, often with Central Asian merchants, decorated the tombs, even in, um, not only as a clay model, but also as a mural, as we can see from this example. Um, somehow the camels without riders are running around uh, with horses with riders. They are playing polos. I don't know why camels are running together, but um, <laughs> this is a tomb of a crown prince of the Tang Dynasty. So having ho multiple horses and even camels um, on the mural, well, that actually signifies the, the status of the deceased. Horse riding was also popular among women in the Tang Dynasty, and there are many clay sculptures of female horse riders as well. But before we um, look at the clay models, let's look at this painting first. This painting is a 12th century copy of an 8th century original depicting Lady Guo Guo's outing. 
So Lady Guo Guo was the Tang Emperor's favorite consort, Yang Guifei's sister. So Lady Guo Guo was also famous for her beauty. So we can get some idea of the 8th century noblewoman's manner from this painting. So we can identify the writer's gender by their short blouse, sashes, and their vol voluminous hair that are consistently found in images of Tang women. One of the ladies is actually holding a little girl here. But um, she seems perfectly composed and comfortable. Since it was not unusual for female members of the Tang society to ride horses, many images of women horse riders have been found from the tombs. And the best example is currently on view in the gallery 131A. I know there are so many surviving um, models, clay models of female horse riders um, across the world in many collections as well, but um, I haven't seen anything of this level. Um, this is really the most beautiful uh, female horse rider I've ever seen, and I really um, encourage you to take a closer, closer look when you have a chance in the gallery. So this um, clay model captures a moment when a female rider makes a turn with her horse. So her round, plump cheeks, long draped gown, and voluminous hairstyle represent the ideals of beauty in the eyes of the imperial court in the mid 8th century China. And many of you may have noticed that this object is different from the Santai pottery we saw earlier. We can see some colors like red and brown, but they are not as vibrant as those with lead-based glazes. These so-called cold pigments applied directly to the clay surface are more vulnerable to deterioration than fired glazes. Despite the faded colors, this model still retains the elaborate texture of the saddle and her flowy robe meticulously crafted in clay before firing. Trade and culture exchange were not limited to land routes where horses and camels could run. People and goods flowed into China through sea routes beginning in the first century common era. The routes marked by the dotted lines were the mar uh, maritime routes. In fact, there was an incident that happened to preserve valuable goods um, shipped from China to the Middle East in the early 9th century. Just one mile off the coast of Belitung Island in Indonesia, an Arab cargo ship sank on its way back, to, uh, way back from southern China. Archaeologists have recovered so-called Tang treasures from the site, including um, this dish with, um, painted with cobalt imported from Iran, and an octagonal cup decorated with Central Asian musicians and dancers. The material and design of these objects attest to the full cycle of people and goods circulating over land and water in Eurasia during the Tang Dynasty. Among the people who came to the Chinese mainland were young boys from the Malay Peninsula or the Indonesian archipelago. This Southeast Asian region was inhabited by relatively dark-skinned people who sent tribute, including young slaves, to the Chinese rulers. These Malay Negrito people from Southeast Asia were known to the Chinese, un, uh, Chinese um, under the umbrella term Kunlun, which has several references. First, Kunlun refers to a primordial mountain mentioned in ancient mythology, and also the mountain, um, actual mountain ranges in Western China that neighbors with the Taklamakan Desert. Also in pre-modern China, it referred to all people with dark skin, regardless of their place of origin. 
It should be noted that those who were called Kunlun were not always enslaved. Free dark-skinned people who were indigenous to China were called Kunlun as well. Although the, although the specific meanings are different, the term Kunlun here implies somewhere far away. The characteristics of this glazed clay boy match, match the Tang description of Kunlun people from Southeast Asia with curly hair, toga-like pants, and darker skin rendered by the amber-colored glaze. With their hands raised and bodies tilted, so they were not harnessing the horse, but they were actually rowing the boat. And um, their ha uh, its hand, uh, his hands actually have two holes as well. So probably there was a wooden pedal stick uh, before, well, it, disappeared somehow. Maybe it was wood and then it, it was perished at some point, but we can still see um, the, the trace of their labor and activities from this model. The Kunlun boys played an important role in various maritime operations. They provided the essential labor needed to propel the ships engaged in long-distance trade. The presence of slaves in communities along the southern coast of China was not uncommon in the Tang Dynasty. Here we can see a glimpse of how 8th century Chinese people represented various others long before the modern-day concept of race was established. All of these clay models of animals, grooms, servants, and entertainers were protected by tomb guardians along with the deceased. These guardians often have the intimidating appearance of beasts or armored warriors, and also taller and bigger than the rest of the models. Images of guardian kings, or also known as heavenly kings, have appeared both in and outside of China. In Tang Dynasty China, images of these guardian kings were installed to defend both secular and religious sites. Monumental images of stone or wood were created for Buddhist temples, while smaller examples like this, uh, this one were made of clay and buried in tombs to protect the deceased. So we can see um, all these uh, this guardian kings stepping on these demons. So um, it's, it is to intimidate the evil spirits who will come to the tomb. But these guardians couldn't protect themselves from thieves. Ironically, exquisite guardian models may have attracted misfortune. In the Tang Dynasty, burial models were displayed during the funerary ritual. So tombs of affluent aristocrats with extravagant objects became easy targets for thieves. More and more people feared that their tombs would be robbed and preferred to be buried with perishable objects or humble looking models when they died. This explains why large-scale Santai figurines were only popular in the early half of the 8th century and declined after the very disrupt disruptive rebellion in 755, um, followed by a Tibetan invasion in 763. But this brief period of half a century coincided with the height of trade and international diplomacy along the Silk Road and Tang porters were able to draw inspiration from a wide range of sources beyond central China. Whether through robbery, archaeological excavation, or trade, Santai wares had come out from the tombs and inspired not only later Chinese potters, but also those along and beyond the Silk Road. As early as the 8th century, so more or less the contemporary, the Tang Dynasty, potters in Japan began to imitate Tang Santai wares. 
Later, Santai traveled west to be used extensively in Syrian, Iranian, and then Italian graffito pottery from the 13th to the mid 15th centuries. Santai wares were revived as high quality porcelain with animal colors to satisfy the antique antiquarian taste of the Qing Dynasty emperors in the 17th and 18th century as well. This revived Santai ware brought the so-called egg and spinach animal colors to Chinese porcelain um, and turned the three-color glazed earthenware into sturdy, safe vessels suitable for everyday use. As such, um, the art of the Tang Dynasty, especially in the first half of the 8th century, reflects the cosmopolitan culture of the capital, which flourished with trade along the Silk Road. What we see today is just the tip of the iceberg of Eurasian culture exchange. Scholars um, around the world continue to debate the definition of the Silk Road as new discoveries are made. So um, some of them called silk roads as plural, or uh, recently there was also another theory that came out um, called a like, gold road, and some scholars even deny uh, the silk road. So there are so many theories around this Eurasian trade route. Um, but one thing um, is certain, despite all of this debate, the movement of people and goods was much more fluid and less tied to specific regions defined by borders. With this in mind, I would like to encourage you to take a look at the Santai wares installed in galleries 130 and 131A, and some of them are also in 133. I know these numbers can be confusing. You can just go to the Chinese art gallery and then walk along and you will see, you will be able to recognize them. Okay, thank you so much. So we have some time for questions. So if you raise your hands, our self staff will come to you with the microphone. Oh, okay. Afraid to so many. <laughs> All right, I've got the first question right over here. Can you show us on this map where Chang'an might have been? So, sorry? The, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, where Chang'an oh, okay. was. Could you highlight that? Ah, thank you. Hi, just interested, uh, you mentioned the Silk Road, the name was, uh, it's debatable, was debatable and also newly discovered recently. Are you talking in terms of uh, English translation? For original in Chinese, uh, Si Chou Zhulu, I, I think it's, it's existing for quite a while ago, so I'm not sure whether the term is in terms of English translation or original, uh, the, where it's originated? Well, again, the, uh, the Chinese term actually was not the original. Actually, in Chinese, it was rather called as Northern Road or Southern Road, um, Lanlu or Beilu in pre-modern um, China. So uh, the Silk Road or um, Suzhou Zhilu, that's rather, again, okay, relatively recent compared to Northern Route or Southern Route. Um, so I think um, in general, in any language, compared to the history of the Silk Road or trade routes across these, um, these continents is relatively recent. And that's, that's one of the reasons why scholars are still debating over the definition and also the, the name itself. So that, that's quite interesting because that trade has been around for centuries. Yeah, many yeah, years, but so. that doesn't, but, but that's yeah, interesting. it was, conti it continued for centuries, lasted and there's no for, name. There was name, so 
well, yeah, uh, they called it again like northern routes and southern routes because um, we see that the routes kind of diverge uh, around the Takonakin Desert here because they cannot really cross the desert directly. So, um, so people usually call it, okay, I'm going through the northern route, I'm going through the southern route, but um, no one really called it as Silk Road. Um, so that's rather a common term in pre-modern uh, time. And, um, and then actually the trade was not really, I mean, no one really traveled all the way to East, Eastern Mediterranean at once or vice versa, except for um, Marco Polo later times. And uh, um, rather they just you know, for, travel from here to here and then come back. But people from here to here and then come back and it's a, it's a series of fragmented trade that connects um, that connected the, the half of the world. So um, that's why the the term Silk Road is rather conceptual than um, the really like actual. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. But that's a really really good uh, question to have in mind because again we we cannot really. Uh, it's really difficult to accept the term um, verbatim. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, just a quick question out of curiosity. Uh, back to the painting of Lady Gorgor's uh, outing, spring outing. I know this is probably not related to Silk Road, but uh, I'm just curious. Okay, it might take a while. That's okay, but which one you is identified as Lady Gorgo in that painting? That's, that's a, a very that's, great question. That's a very uh, famous painting, I know. Yeah. Well, actually, no one knows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I know it can be a too much information, but uh, some scholars, I mean, they even have doubt that it, it, it actually depicts Lady Gogo and um, her attendants because it is solely based on the inscription written later. Um, but um, considering uh, the composition of the painting and then the, um, their poster or the place, uh, probably this is Lady Gogo, but again, there is no right answer. There's no right answer. It's just a kind of common understanding at this point that this painting depicts her um, excursion. But thank you so much for pointing that out. We have a question on this side over here. Did you have your hand up? I just had a technical question. How did they regulate and measure the firing temperature of kills? That's a <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for your question. Well, um, again, that's really difficult to to track that uh, track down uh, precisely. But again, it's just um, based on their experience, and um, of course, they failed a lot too. And they well, Chinese have um, may had been made. Uh, have been making earthenware for so long time. So by that time, they had enough technique to control the temperature. So actually, um, sun tie wares, uh, they need to be fired twice. So the first is the bisque, uh, bisque firing. So they uh, fire in an even lower temperature, like six to 800 degrees Celsius. And then the, for the second firing to stabilize the glaze, they have to, um, fire up up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And actually this time they could even um, make the higher temperature up to 1,200 degrees Celsius for uh, a sturdier um, stone wares. So uh, I, be, I guess it was an accumulation of knowledge and experience. Um, it's been already uh, more than several hundred years of making earthenware by this time. So. Uh, Although there was a lot um, much contingency that can ruin the firing, like oxygen coming in from the outside and so forth. Uh, but again, what we see is what they uh, succeeded and 
they had enough um, knowledge and te um, technology to control the fire, but that's a really um, great question, and thanks for sharing. Was there an etiquette that determined what pieces were left in bisque and what were glazed? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Was there an etiquette that determined what pieces were left in bisque and which ones were glazed? Oh, okay. Yeah, great. That, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. That's a really great question. And actually, um, just uh, bisque or or like. Um, those clay models with only cold pigments, they appeared earlier, slightly earlier than the glazed, um, Santai glazed clays and pottery. Um, well, there's no written documents that can tell the, the, the exact standard of what to, be, uh, what to be left or what to uh, move forward in the process of making, um, but it might depend on the cost of the production and also the, um, the commissioner's need and um, their order and preference. So uh, eighth century when the Santai glazed potteries were already popular, there were still a lot of um, um, unglazed pottery models as well. Um, they might, uh, uh, well, we assume that that will largely depend on the cost or the regulation, um, the some on the tomb burial models. So there are many um, as reasons. They, they, I think there were many reasons behind what to be left um, um, unglazed and what to be glazed. And thank you so much for your question. I think we have time for one or two more questions. We've got one in the back over here on your right, Sunghee. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Well, how were the artists organized? Is there any notation to indicate were they in guilds or was it family tradition and legacy that skills and secrets and how to do all the, the artisan technical abilities were they, were they passed between generations and how, how did they receive commissions to make their beautiful artwork? Oh, thank you so much for your question. Well, I really hope we can know their names. Um, unfortunately, there is no... Um, no record that can identify the makers and their names. But again, it, well, it is probably a workshop uh, operated and multiple people were involved in making these models because it's really labor intensive. So someone need to need the clay, someone need to prepare the clay, someone need to sculpt. And actually there are, most of them are molded. So um, someone, ex even had to make the mold separately and then pour the clay and then do the base fire. And then someone probably uh, was specialized in, in applying glazes. So um, we can assume that there were so many people involved and probably um, operated as a workshop. And well, at least we know some um, kiln sites based on the archeological um, studies. So, uh, Probably um, villagers around the kiln site um, had to had the business around there. So that's the, the 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 only information we have, unfortunately. And actually, it's a lot later in in Chinese art history that the potters um, left their names on their work. So it's uh, yeah, fortunately we don't know who made them, but um, again. Yeah, it's really nice that they still survive so that we can appreciate them. We'll take this final question up here at the front. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, for the importance of the horses to the aristocrats, um, were the grooms considered high status employees or there was a high status job, was it, to take care of the horses for the king or whoever the local gentry was, was, was that the case? Uh, um, can you 
Can you, sorry, can what, you repeat Was it that? a valuable job in the society yeah. to be a groom oh. for the horses? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, considering that there are not many written records, there are little written records about grooms. We only have models of them, either in um, Santai pottery or even earlier, uh, earlier time, like unglazed pottery of grooms with um, animals. Uh, so we can assume that they were, uh, they were um, important people in the society, but uh, they were never hiring officials or hiring people um, important enough to be recorded in the historical documents. So probably they worked for like um, aristocrats household or imperial households, um, but um, they, unfortunately, they were not their family members who, can, who could be documented in the um, written records. Thank you so yeah, much, Sung Hee. Yeah. And I think that concludes our program. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>